At the beginning of the 1930s, Stalin's grip on power in Russia was absolute, and for the people of the Soviet Union, it would become the bloodiest decade of his rule. I think that by the end of the 1920s, Stalin was in the grips of some form of paranoia and saw himself surrounded by enemies, internal, external, in the party, in the country. And the terror, to some extent, was driven by his own paranoid fears. What became known as the Great Terror began at the Communist Party Congress in 1934, where Stalin was expecting his re-election as party secretary to be a formality. To his horror, 300 of the delegates voted against his nomination, and only three against the popular party favorite, Kirov. That reinforced his sense that there was um, a faction in the party uh, who were trying to unseat him, and he then began to see enemies everywhere. Stalin's revenge for this treachery was swift. Kirov was assassinated in mysterious circumstances later that year, of the 1,961 delegates who had attended the 17th Congress, 1,108 of them were shot. Of the 139 Central Committee members, 98 were shot. The purges were a device to really to um, consolidate the new discipline that Stalin was imposing on the society. Everybody knew that if you didn't give total loyalty and visible dedication to Stalin, you could be sent to the cellars of the Lubyanka and executed immediately, or you could be sent to prison or camp for 25 years, and many were. From their headquarters in the Lubyanka, the NKVD, under Stalin's orders, spread fear throughout the country. Thousands were arrested and accused of everything from spying and sabotage to plotting Stalin's assassination. Stalin himself signed thousands of death warrants. One word, one movement of his finger would change the fate of millions of people, the fates of whole nations. Boris Yefimov was one of the Soviet Union's leading political caricaturists during the 30s. His brother Koltsov, a writer, was a victim of Stalin's terror. My older brother was a very well-known popular figure, very energetic, intelligent, an independent person. Stalin didn't like this sort of person. He only liked those who fulfilled his orders without any hesitation. At last, the day, or the night to be precise, of Koltsov's fate arrived. On the night of February the 2nd, 1940, after a year in an NKVD prison, Koltsov was shot. As the brother of one of Stalin's enemies, Boris Yefimov was also targeted for arrest. To be compassionate was not in his nature. Why did he spare me then? The answer is simple. He liked my drawings. In exile in Mexico, Stalin's old enemy Trotsky was murdered with an ice pick in 1940. The army that Trotsky founded was itself purged. 40,000 officers were arrested, almost 15,000 shot, and the rest sent to camps to be worked to death. Stalin was more or less saying to the people of the Soviet Union, look, nobody is beyond my reach. Nobody is safe. Not only did Stalin execute his victims, he erased them from history altogether. He spared no one. Nikolai Yeshov, the NKVD commander, was arrested and shot in 1940. Stalin made him disappear too. Not even Stalin's wife, Nadezda, survived the Great Terror. Driven to despair by his treatment of her, during a party in 1932 for his ministers, she left the room and shot herself.
Ironically, the more severe Stalin became, the more he was revered by the people. A combination of propaganda and the ever-present threat of persecution turned Stalin into a demigod. This became known as the cult of personality. The idea as the cult developed was that Russian people owed everything to the party, to the state, and to the leader. So, in this sense, the whole society was in debt. One important aspect of this, um, what I call the economy of the gift, was the importance of thanking Stalin because you were in debt and you were thanking for all these gifts and presents, in a sense, all the social services, everything you got. And the slogan, thank you, Comrade Stalin, for a happy childhood, represented that idea that children were having a happy childhood because Stalin had provided for them. One of those happy children was the girl who appeared in this photograph. Called Friend of the Little Children, it was taken in 1936 and chose Stalin holding six-year-old Gelia Markizova. She remembers the day the photograph was taken. I got up and took the flowers to the presidium. When somebody asked me where I was going, I said to Stalin. Then everybody started shouting, kiss him, kiss him. I remember the feeling of happiness because I was in Stalin's arms. The next morning I woke up and I was unbelievably famous. Gelia's celebrity was short-lived. A year later, Gelia's father, Ardan, was accused of spying and arrested. My mother said she wasn't worried at all, because my father simply knew that he wasn't guilty. He said the confusion would be sorted out, and he'd be back soon. It all turned out to be very different. He was shot in 1938. A year after her father's murder, Gelia's mother was found with her throat cut. The official explanation was suicide. But 50 years later, Gelia found out that her mother had been murdered on the orders of Stalin's new NKVD chief, Lavrentia Beria. In her KGB file, I found a letter to Beria from the local head of the NKVD in Tajikistan. The letter said that Dominika Fedorovan Markizova lives in exile in our town. Her daughter was photographed in Stalin's arms. Also, she has gifts from Stalin and five photographs. We are worried that she is going to show off. That's exactly how they put it. Then there was a question, what should we do? Beria clearly wrote next to it in blue pencil, eliminate. Although Stalin's terror eased by 1939, a greater one awaited the Russian people in the shape of Adolf Hitler, the man who regarded Stalin as the real genius of political terror. On June the 22nd, 1941, the Nazis invaded Russia, but Stalin was completely unprepared. Weakened by the purges of the 1930s, almost 65% of the Red Army had been captured or killed in the first few months, and the Nazis were less than a mile from Moscow. A lot of people say what Stalin did for Russia was that he enabled them to push back the tanks of Hitler in World War II. But I would say that, in fact, Firstly, the invasion would never have got so far because all those people on the western borderlands who welcomed Hitler with open arms would have fought against him. And secondly, the industrial, the agricultural and the base of the country and its morale would have been in a proper state to fight in 1941 instead of in 1943-4. to fall. In a conflict of unprecedented savagery, the Soviet people threw themselves into the war. But even as the Russians died in their millions at Stalingrad, or starved to death in the siege of Leningrad, Stalin continued to terrorize them. If you had been 
in prison or in camp before the war. You were mobilized, you went to the front. Whatever you did at the front and you came back, you were immediately rearrested and sent back. The repeaters, they were called. Now that, to my mind, does encapsulate the utter cruelty and cynicism of, this, of the Stalinist system. When Berlin fell in May 1945, the Russian people, who had seen 27 million of their compatriots die in the war, felt that they had earned a better future. It meant nothing to Stalin. <laughs>